Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. When Socrates asked the question, how should man live, Plato and Aristotle answered that man should live a life of virtue. Plato claimed there were four great virtues, temperance, justice, prudence and courage. And the Christian church added three more, faith, hope and love. But where does the motivation for virtue come from? Do we need rules to tell us how, we, how to behave, or can we rely on our feelings of compassion and empathy towards other human beings? Shakespeare's Iago said, Virtue, a fig. It is in ourselves and that we are thus or thus. Our bodies are our gardens, to the which our wills are gardeners. So is virtue a character trait possessed by some, but not others? Is it derived from reason, or does it flow from the innate sympathies of the human heart? For the last 2,000 years, philosophers have grappled with these ideas, but now in the 21st century, a modern reappraisal of virtue is taking the argument back to the Greeks with Aristotle. With me to discuss, vir to discuss virtue are the philosophers Galen Strawson, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Reading, Miranda Fricker, Lecturer in Philosophy at Birkbeck College, University of London, and Roger Crisp, Euhero Fellow and Tutor in Philosophy at St Anne's College, Oxford. Roger Crisp, Plato, as I understand it, believed in a set of cardinal virtues. What were they and where did they come from? Well, the name of the cardinal virtues comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge. So the idea is that the other virtues somehow hinge on those cardinal virtues, the ones you mentioned, uh, justice, wisdom, <coughs> temperance and courage. And there are various positions on why those vir central virtues are thought to be central. One is that they're necessary for having the other virtues. Uh, another might be that those four virtues are somehow involved in the exercise of the others. And I think more plausibly, the idea might be that those four virtues are concerned with certain central spheres of human life, which require the governance of reason. So I guess the, the spheres that I have in mind might be one's own life, which would be perhaps the concern of wisdom or prudence, the lives of others, which might be the concern of justice, the control of fear, it's obviously a key emotion in human life, which would be the concern of courage. And finally, temperance, of course, would be concerned with the control of the, the appetites. Did, did, did these, as I understand it, these weren't thought up, as it were, by Plato, but somehow received by him. Well, what, where did they come from? Have well, for him, that? yes, for him, it's almost certain they came from the thought of Socrates. He probably picked up the idea from, as it were, Greek common sense. And Plato really adopted the same attitude towards them that Socrates did. I mean, Socrates actually questioned uh, the, 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 this, this uh, particular set of virtues and approached them in the following way. He was trying to find out whether there was a hierarchy. And in fact, uh, he thought there was in a very extreme way. He thought that really there was only one virtue. That was the virtue of wisdom or knowledge. So really, he collapsed the cardinal virtues and all the virtues into one, making wisdom prominent and that's really a strategy that runs through Plato, Aristotle and other thinkers about the virtues right through to Aquinas. Aristotle's notion, can you develop Aristotle's notion of uh, magnanimousness, the great soul person? Yes, I mean magnanimity is the, is the usual translation but it is perhaps better described as great souledness and here the idea is that the, the key virtue is uh, a virtue of character uh, it requires you're having all the other virtues and he calls it the crown of the virtues and what I think is particularly interesting about it is that the, the, the main concern of the magnanimous person he says is honour. So already we see the importance of reputation and the way you appear to other people emerging in thinking about the virtues. Miranda Fricker, Aristotle was a pragmatist and he said that the way to find virtue was to apply the rule of the golden mean to individual situations. What did, can you develop that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Aristotle's view of how we acquire the virtues was one that I think is still very plausible today. The thought is really that you learn to be good or learn to um, have a particular virtue such as um, courage through doing it and he makes a comparison with the craft. So for instance, if you're a carpenter, the way you learn to be a good carpenter is by, so to speak, practicing being a good carpenter. You won't wind up as a good carpenter if you keep on practicing banging nails in wonkily, as it were. The way to cultivate a habit in you of banging nails in straight is by practicing doing just that. 
Um, certainly anyone who's learned a musical instrument knows that they mustn't practice the mistake, so to speak, so in that sense it remains very plausible. So here we have this notion of a sort of practical training or habituation into um, being virtuous in one or another kind. Now, his conception of what the virtuous characteristic was, and here, as always in speaking about the Greeks, one has to be a little careful. We have a translation of virtue, and no doubt that'll do fine, but the Greek word's arete, and very often it's thought that the better interpretation or translation of that is excellence, an excellence of character, and a well-entrenched excellence of character, so that it doesn't have any moralistic overtones that perhaps in the modern period it's come to have. So, um, in the example of courage, which is, I think, an important one, one has the idea that courage is placed between two extreme entrenched characteristics. One will be cowardice at the one end, and the other extreme will be something like foolhardiness. And the mean, or golden mean as it's sometimes called, is where the virtue is situated, and in this case we name that virtue courage. Um, so the courageous person, as it were, may well go into battle and um, do some things which involve his being in great danger and so on, but he won't just go in willy-nilly in a foolhardy manner, nor will he cower behind the ranks, so to speak. So that, that's the idea of the mean. It's the midway point between two extremes of the characteristic. But one, one person's midway point would be another person's extreme, wouldn't it? Well... I mean, some people, might, myself, would think it would be very <laughs> foolhardy that a courageous man would think, well, this is mere courage. Well, it may be that people, there's room for disagreement about um, exactly what sort of behaviours demonstrate the mean. Um, but certainly for Aristotle, I think the idea is that we have a common understanding of what the two extremes are and we have to uh, locate the mean through the operation of uh, a gen more general notion of, of wisdom as, as, as that's the notion that Roger pointed out. So for Aristotle too, um, wisdom is a very important factor in how we behave and how we locate the means between different extremes. Where did Aristotle think that these judgments about how to behave came from? Did you think you were born with them? You've talked about habituation, uh, practicing being good, practicing virtue, like practicing the piano or practicing to be a carpenter. Well, Where do you think they came from? Um, to some extent they're in our nature for sure but his emphasis is always on training and habituation um, so he thought they were for sure in our nature you threw that away but you think Aristotle thought that yes yes I think that'd be a fair interpretation others can um, may disagree but uh, I mean certainly when one reads in Lycomachy and Ethics for instance um, one finds there uh, a great emphasis on the training of uh, dispositions, so to speak, so presumably one, the dispositions were, as it were, not conjured out of the ether. Galen Rawson, there was this idea also of the unity of the virtues. What, can you describe what that is and whether you think it holds? Uh, can I sort of preface that with something else? The first thing I really want to say is that the word virtue nowadays has this sort of negative connotation in, as in, oh, she's really virtuous. <laughs> and I think it's very important just we have to completely put that aside because it's seen as a, clearly as, as a po totally positive thing in, in the philosoph philosophical tradition that we're talking about now. Now, the, uh, the unity of the virtues, I'm, I'm inclined to defer that to Roger because that's, that's a matter of ancient Greek thought. But one, well, here's an illustration. Um, the four cardinal virtues, uh, temperance, justice, practical wisdom, and courage, um, what, a lot of people thought that you either had all of them or you couldn't have any one without having the others. So that, for example, a bad man cannot be courageous. So, so that's the sense in which they're thought to hang together necessarily. If we, I, mean, I disagree with that. It seems to be quite clear that a very wicked man could be very brave indeed. But I think people who believe in the unity of the virtues will say, well, no, um, courage in this, it just isn't courage in him, what this apparent bravery. And so they hang together in that sense. I'm sorry to take a huge j jump, but do you want to come back on that for a second, Roger, before I jump ahead with Gail into the... Well, to the just, just briefly, I think there are really two conceptions of the unity of the virtues. The strong conception is the Socratic conception that I mentioned, <clears throat> according to which there really is only one virtue, and that's knowledge. A weaker version is the version which says, if you have any one virtue, you must have the lot. And that's what you find in, in Aristotle. And... I, I, I'm with Galen, really, that it doesn't seem that, that plausible, but there is an argument for it. Um, and it relies on the idea that if you have a virtue, you must get it right. If, you have, if it looks as if you have, say, the virtue of generosity because you go around giving away you know, lots of money 
um, to the right people at the right times and so on. And then you come into a situation where to exercise that virtue requires the exercise of courage. If you don't have courage, you're not going to do it. So for Aristotle, as for Plato, virtue requires getting it right. And that really requires having all the virtues. The, uh, can we move to the, uh, the way that the Greek ideas clashed with the Christian ideas? What did, did they have, was there, is there anything that the Christians and the Greeks had in common about what constituted virtue, Galen? Well, um, I think, yes, there is, but there are, I guess there's two main things to say. One is that they had a different list, not that, that overlapping, but significantly different lists of what were the virtues. And the other thing is that they had um, completely different reasons give, were given for being virtuous. So the question, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to indulge slightly in caricature, but let's imagine the question, why should I be virtuous? Um, here's the Aristotelian caricature. I don't know how much of a caricature it is, but uh, Arist one of the things at least that Aristotle might say is that you should be virtuous because it's in your interest to be, because if you are, then you will flourish. You will have a happy life, a flourishing life in the sense of eudaimonia which is the, the, the Greek term for flourishing. Um, he might, I think uh, the other thing you'll do is you will be a good example of a human being. And I think there's even a slight an aesthetic element in that. The project of trying to be a very good example of a human being. Um, obviously, <clears throat> if you are virtuous, this will um, mean that you have, you treat other people well as well. So that it will, <clears throat> it will also affect your relations with others. But there is a fundamental sense in which it's a project of self-improvement and self-perfection. Um, and if you ask, so that's the Greek Aristotelian idea of why you should be virtuous. If you ask uh, a Christian why one should be virtuous, I think it has to, the first answer has to be to do with serving God or something like that. Um, and uh, or the second thing to say about the, the, the Christian list as opposed to the, the Greek list is it's much more other directed. You're thinking much, it's much more concerned with your relations with others. So you have kindness and benevolence, neither of which feature on the on the Greek list, mercy, forgiveness, and so on. Um, Self-sacrifice, for instance, as well. Yes. Um, and another way, perhaps, of getting a strong contrast is to say one of the, virtu one of the virtues the Christian, on the Christian list is sadness in the old sense, which is the Chaucerian sense, which means constancy, patience, resignation, submission, service, you know, submission to the will of God, and so on. And that would have been completely alien, I think, to Aristotle, and in fact, all the Greeks. Aquinas, as I understand it, in the 13th century, attempted to synthesize these two philosophies in his Summa Theologia. How successful was that? Um, just, just a I think what I'd like to say first is that he, sometimes it's thought that he was the first to do that, and that isn't the case, because I believe that St. Ambrose in the 4th century AD was already trying to do something like that. Um, what, how successful was he? Well, uh, he, he, was very, he made a very good job of it. You, you, one thing you might say is that he internalized the four cardinal virtues. So, for example, courage, which really was partly to do with physical valor in the Greek time, Courage becomes reasons, um, reasons perseverance in the face of contrary, irascible passions. So it's to do with you. it's really your internal struggle against your passions. Um, <clears throat> practical wisdom gets turns into the word prudence, in, um, which somehow seems to diminish it in my view. <laughs> but I guess prudence is meant to have a pretty wide re reading there. Um, practical wisdom for him is just a life in accordance with reason. Uh, so I suppose in a way that's co cognitive and connects up with the Socratic notion that it's knowledge that's virtue. Let me just quickly say the other two. Um, temperance, that again is reason's rest restraint um, uh, of your self-serving passions. And um, which, one, which is the one I missed out? Oh yes, justice. Um, that would be reason's governance of your relations with others in spite of your selfish impulses. So it's all sort of internalised and moralised. Do you get a feeling that, that, that he set up a situation which, is, which went on for many centuries but was fundamentally, as Nietzsche said much later, there's a complete opposition between Greek and Christian uh, ideas in, uh, of morality and despite his extraordinary cleverness and so on and so forth, uh, the opposition remained and it was a false attempt. It was never going to succeed. Yes, I... 
I don't know how influential he was, um, but also I think there are just too many strands in Christianity for, for, for to say that he, 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 he tried to, that this thing failed and it, it sort of... Well, as you know, Alistair McIntyre thinks that we now we inherited this completely contradictory tradition. But uh, you can also find in the Christian tradition... Um, ideals of virtue, and I'm thinking of St. Augustine, who's, who famously said, only love and then do what you will. So he had the idea that if you had this, that's, if you had the virtue of love, then you could just, everything could just flow from your character, and you wouldn't have to be obeying rules and principles and commands at all. So there's this tradition which is quite separate from Aquinas. Briefly, Roger Chris, what do you think about what flowed from Aquinas? Um, <coughs> well, I think I'd really go along with everything that uh, Galen has said there. There was, there's a further aspect of Aquinas which is, is rather interesting, um, which links up with what Miranda said about how Aristotle thought that we acquired the virtues. He did think that we acquired the virtues through training and habituation. But when Aquinas bolts on the three th theological virtues, faith, hope and charity, oh, no. so that we now have, as it were, seven cardinal virtues, <clears throat> it turns out that you don't get those through training you get them through grace which raises all sorts of questions about uh, how reasonable it is to blame somebody for not not having those virtues um, and those virtues clearly are uh, relevant to uh, life as a pilgrimage on earth towards um, heavenly bliss Miranda, can I, I'm sorry about these leaps but there you go a Hume said that morality is determined by sentiment so how did he perceive virtue what is he saying there yes could I just say one brief thing to yes. supplement something Galen said um, um, I agree absolutely with the contrast that he drew between um, ancient and Christian thought just uh, the point about the motivation for being good is a very interesting one and um, of course the thought that as well there's a somehow distal motivation or overriding motivation for being good that is fl flourishing in the distance as it were doesn't mean as as sometimes people think it does when they first read this stuff that that must be as well your immediate motivation certainly when you teach undergraduates people often think that you're being good in order to be happy which would be a different idea and I think um, Galen's point is that as it were the overriding uh, explanation for why it's good to be virtuous is that as it were ultimately it leads to a a flourishing and happy life but that doesn't mean that in the process of habituation that I was describing what you're learning is as it were how best to make yourself happy in some more immediate sense what you're learning is um, how to enjoy being good so as it were the fully virtuous person who's fully internalized these attitudes will find that he or she uh, is made happy by acting that way and enjoys them whereas a, a less than fully virtuous person someone who's who's on the road to having had the full training so to speak is uh, doing their best to emulate the virtues but won't yet have this feeling of fully enjoying them so it's part of um, the Aristotelian idea of habituation or training that you're learning to enjoy uh, learning to gain happiness from being good so I yes, that's right. just as it were supplementing what Galen said on that score yeah so you work you work pretty hard and you may not be enjoying yourself very much but then the phrase is virtue is its own reward yes. and that you actually it's actually good for you too it makes yes. you happy in your life did Hume take the argument on in a different direction then uh, yes I well just um, that's let's see, in in Hume I mean how did he perceive virtue he had a very specific uh, theory of virtues in a, in a certain sense. He made a distinction between natural virtues and artificial virtues. Now for Hume, natural virtues are those dispositions or sort of praiseworthy character traits which we human beings naturally have. It was a sort of quasi-anthropological claim as it were. So in particular the love of children, um, uh, sympathy with one's fellow man, pity for the unfortunate. These things he thought that other things being equal were built into human nature so to speak. The artificial virtues on the other hand are more an artifact of social life so the artificial virtues that he mentions for instance are respect for promises and respect for private property and clearly those are 
semi-institutional virtues. I mean, you could have a society where promise-keeping wasn't quite the institution as we know it and where there wasn't private property in the sense that capitalist societies are used to there being private property. So they're more contingent, if you like, and more, as I'd like to say, though this isn't a very human way of putting it, more constructed. So um, that was his view, and his idea was that at the bottom of one's ethical outlook and what it takes to be virtuous is a fundamental human capacity for sympathy, sympathy with one's fellow man and, and especially fellow man suffering. So and we from that flow, yes, yeah. then from that uh, flows our capacity for these other virtues. Um, and in particular, I mean, picking up on the Aristotelian notion of training, it's, it's rather different in Hume, but Hume has got. Uh, a social conception of the virtues, it seems to me, and what it takes to learn to be good, in that he um, cites, for instance, how one person cares about getting respect from another person, and that these uh, relations of caring for the other's respect are reciprocal, and so through these, these social relations, so to speak, we all come to care about being regarded as virtuous, and the whole sort of system pulls itself up by its bootstraps so from this initial starting point of sympathy. Is given approbation, in a way. Yes. Yes. Though I, I wouldn't I, like to I present that as a just, just a definition, as yeah. it were. But I think yes. that's absolutely dead, dead right, because, I mean, Hume's, uh, Hume really had the first secular modern ethics of, of virtue, and I think it does come exactly out of that idea of... Approbation. Approbation, mm -hmm. um, which one finds in Shaftesbury. I mean, Shaftesbury said the virtuous action is the one that's done from a motive we approve of. Hutchison then goes on to say, well, the motive we approve of is benevolence. And Hume just takes that and, and runs with it. And what's particularly interesting about it, I think, is that um, Hume was really beginning there uh, the, uh, the modern tradition of utilitarianism, the idea that we should produce the greatest good, which is these days seen very much as in opposition to an ethics of virtue. So, in fact, we see there the, the tradition of utilitarianism coming out of a virtue, the virtue of benevolence. Can we... Uh as it were, take a sidestep here. Galus wasn't it? Hume believed in unselfish behaviour. Uh, can we? Is there any way that we can put a uh, bring Darwin into that argument? Because uh, did Darwin distort that idea um, <coughs> so massively? <coughs> That's a large issue. But <coughs> they all are, I'm afraid. Yes. <laughs> um, one of the problems well, we've got on this one. program. <laughs> What we battle on, <laughs> using the four kinds of Yeah, virtues. I mean, <laughs> I, I think the first thing to do is the first thing to do would be you need to put Hume in context to some extent, and the, con the crucial context is that his predecessor Hobbes, because Hobbes held that human beings. I thought, we were were, I, thought I was hopping Hobbes because I was oh, looking at the clock. Well, but it's all right. Well, bring in Hobbes. We can go from Hobbes to Darwin a lot faster. Exactly, faster-ly. we yes. can, because <laughs> Hobbes thought that we were all. Uh, 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 only acted in our self-interest. Well, and war with each other, just, really. Yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes think that he was clinically paranoid, <laughs> Hobbes, because he had this view of the war of every man against every man. Yeah. And, ba and basically all that Hume and, and uh, another contemporary, Bishop Butler, did was to say that's just empirically false. Human beings do have these, sympathy, these um, feelings of sympathy for others and benevolence. Um, just a fact about how we are that Hobbes completely got wrong. Um, now, you asked about Darwin. Well, you might... Uh, you could say that Dar Dar Darwinism was um, originally seen as, as it were, um, the proof of that Hobbes was right after all, because you know it's, it's, it's a theory about how there's a struggle survival for survival and everybody's out for themselves. But um, actually, you can show how uh, moral motives arise even within the framework of theory of evolution. I don't know if you want me to try to do that. Well, Take think... a bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it gets a bit too long, I'll wave my okay. hands. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, clear, it's clearly a real problem, and, um, since uh, it seems that the, 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 the best thing to do in order to survive and pr reproduce is to be totally out for yourself all the time. But there is a story which shows how sort of real virtue or, or niceness can arise, even in those circumstances. And it arises, if you like, from, from self-interest and deception. Um, I'll try and, I could try and tell one of those just-so stories that you probably heard of this, people like to tell. Um, so... Here's a brief story. Suppose that the potential advan advantages of cooperation with others are great, which they are for us. Um, uh, so it seems that your best bet from the point of view of self-interest is to cooperate with others when it benefits you and to cheat on them when they, you know, when they call in the favour. Um, so that's fine. You should be doing very well, getting the benefits of other people's cooperation and then not, not repaying them. Um, it's fine until those you, you exploit get good at detecting cheats. 
And this is what they called an arms race. Uh, for now, they can and they will aim to enter into cooperative relations only with those whom they consent not to be cheats. So they'll shut you out from the benefits of cooperation. Um, so you need to deceive them into thinking you're honest in order to continue to participate in the benefits of cooperation. But they are increasingly hard to fool. Um, and in the end, the most reliable and economical way to deceive them is to deceive yourself. But by far the most reliable and economical way to deceive yourself is actually to have the feeling of commitment <laughs> to honest cooperation. But then it's a real feeling. But it's you a, cheated yourself into a real feeling. Yeah, no, but this... <coughs> yes, exactly. It is a kind of self-deception. Um, but so self-deception turns into sincerity if you self-deceive yeah, enough. And I, th I think our first reaction to that is to think, well, then, it isn't a real moral motive. Um, but I think, I think that's wrong. It isn't less valuable or real because it grew originally out of self-interest and deception. That would be like saying that diamonds are really coal or, or, you know, that a rose that grows on a dunghill isn't as beautiful as a rose that grows in a golden pot. Um, they really are genuinely felt. Um, desire to cooperate, loyalty, fidelity, and so on. But they have this curious ancestry, but it doesn't mean they aren't what they seem to be. They really are. It's a very interesting question, though, how far the origins of something can be undermining to it when you discover them. I mean, it, it may not be that, as it were, the mere fact of its having this kind of dunghill history <laughs> or history of self-deception uh, is enough to somehow devalue it. And yet when the person who has these feelings discovers that she's only got them because of this original self-deception what's her response is a rational response to then rethink or just to stay with them and this is something we find in Nietzsche that I don't want to jump ahead too much but I, as it I were, think yeah. I think you must jump where you want now well, yeah. well, well, I mean, one, 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 all rules one, are off I'll okay. jump to Nietzsche after. <laughs> well, <okay. laughs> well, I mean one place to, to jump is back to to Hume because Hume has a very similar story particularly about the artificial virtue of justice that it it, it really arises out of self-interest and um, what happens is it arises out of self-interest, self but, but because you're naturally benevolent, you start to see the, the, the social value in justice and so it takes on a beauty of its own. Mm. And I think that's not, a, not an implausible psychology, actually. Yes. Absolutely. And not one that you'd have thought really ought to undermine the current psychology. One could perfectly well discover that that was the origin of one's benevolent feelings um, without, as it were, feeling one ought to then discard them. But I think in the Nietzschean case, I mean, the story um, usually thought to be a debunking story that uh, Nietzsche tells, isn't? it's not meant to be... Uh, not evolutionary for sure and uh, it's not clear whether it's exactly strictly historical but he calls it a genealogy of morals so one's looking at the origin of um, moral concepts particularly Christian moral concepts of good and evil and so on and he says there that as it were at the heart of Christian morality there's a great big fat lie which uh, is that roughly speaking the Christian idea is uh, one of rejecting the will to power um, and in favour of um, an idea of justice and, as it were, uh, uh, the idea that meekness and gentleness is laudable. And they, according to Nietzsche, fabricate the idea of an afterlife where those who have been meek in this world will, as it were, gain their uh, just deserts uh, in heaven, etc. And the idea is that all this is, is owing to a rejection of the will to power and, a, and a, an embracing of some other kind of justice, whereas Nietzsche thinks that actually the true motivation is itself a will to power on the part of those who peddle the Christian doctrine, because really the motivation is just frustration at powerlessness um, and a kind of a will, therefore, to find some consoling myth in the notion of justice and the afterlife and so on to, to make them feel better while they're here. So, in fact, they've outwilled to power <laughs> even those who would otherwise have embraced uh, uh, the idea that you can just be out for what you can get. So, in a strange sense, he comes to admire uh, Christian morality for outdoing its opponents, even on, <laughs> on their own terms. But there it does seem to me that if a Christian or someone dedicated to Christian-style notions of good and evil came to believe this Nietzschean story, it would shake one somewhat if you came to believe it. You would start to think, well, actually, that, that's quite a dunghill we're looking at there, as it were. The rose isn't looking so good now. Can I switch you again? Roger Crisp, um, Kant's position on virtue seems to me to be, from, uh, in contrast to Hume, because he believed that sentiment should be removed and moral decisions should be based strictly on reason and what he ended up with, the idea of the categorical imperative. Mm. Could you develop that for us or unravel yes. that a bit? Um, well, I mean, as I see it, Kant's ethics really came out of his metaphysics. 
that is out of his, uh, out of the way he saw the world and he saw the world the world that surrounds us essentially as determined um, in other words all our passions and sentiments are not our responsibility they just arise in us so they can't have any moral value if you perform some benevolent action well that might be nice but you don't deserve any moral credit because it's something that just happened we do know he says that uh, people can do morally valuable things so that means that there must be another aspect to our nature what he calls the noumenal self which in some way uh, can enable us to act freely rationally and morally in this world in a sense um, so there's there's a, in a sense a fundamental contradiction which we'll never understand between determinism and freedom at the heart of Kantian metaphysics but essentially the idea is that the sentiments really can't have any genuine moral value because they're they're not our responsibility so what was his categorical imperative then? well the categorical imperative is a law that binds all rational beings if you're a rational being you want to live according to <coughs> the laws of reason so when you construct an argument you want to follow the laws of logic when you act you want to follow the uh, the laws of practice and the categorical imperative for Kant is in a sense a purely formal notion and it says that what you've got to do is uh, act only on principles that any rational being um, would would act upon in the same situation that you're in and in a sense it's rather coming out of the idea of the golden rule the idea that you have to put yourself into other people's positions and see whether they can accept what you're doing Gaines Rosson does this mean that if you do something uh, because you want to do it just if you give some money to somebody who, who looks as if they need some money or act in a friendly manner to someone uh, because you feel like it this has got no value and the value is if you do it because you know it is your duty to do it I believe um, I'm, I hesitate I mean I believe that's my understanding of Kant but I believe some people are trying to prove that it's not that simple yes the idea is that if you um, yes if you do a very kind act just because it flows out out of your virtuous disposition your natural benevolence it has no moral worth at all as Roger said you, uh, it only has moral worth if you if you do it because it's your duty it must be duties for duty for duty's sake is the only thing that has moral worth. Yes. That doesn't mean, of course, that it has no value at all, but it doesn't have this distinctive kind of value that Kant's on about in, in as it were, morality, the special thing that he thinks can be isolated off from other sorts of motivations we may have that may have a valuable part in human life, in friendship and so on. It's not that Kant, as it were, didn't value friendship, but he didn't think that, for instance, the motivation of friendship or love could lead to an act which had this distinctive kind of value, moral value. And th there's a real contrast <coughs> there between Aristotle and Kant. Um, for Aristotle, the, the best kind of person to be is the moral saint. That is the person who uh, has the right sentiments, the right passions, the right desires, and just enjoys doing the right thing. There's no struggle. Whereas for Kant, the ideal moral agent is the moral hero, the person who's really tempted to do something nasty, but manages to resist because it's their duty. Yes, that's what yes. Kant yes. says, that the, 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 the value of the act shines forth more brightly in those circumstances where the agent is, as it were, torn, but succeeds in doing the, the right, dutiful thing after all. Right. I mean, this, this, there are these two completely opposed models of what it is to be virtuous. One is when it just flows, and that, you basically you, you just do what you want because you're virtuous and so everything comes out right. Out of your character. So that's mm -hmm. effortless, it's an effortlessness, character. whereas the other the model... well-trained character. Yeah, yeah the model of that of um, achieved virtue is completely effortless and then the model of uh, virtue is a struggle and Aristotle doesn't care too much about whether it's your responsibility that you have this character what matters is that you have it mm -hmm. which I think is rather rather Galen's position whereas Kant seems obsessed with the idea that you've got to be able to claim this is is my work so, somebody tried to partly rescue Kant I think by saying well look, it's all right if you do want to do it <laughs> It's not actually as long as, I don't know whether it's as long as you would have done it anyway because it was your duty or whether it actually has to be that you did do it because it was your duty, although you also wanted to do it. Yes, <laughs> yes I mean, quite what the, mo the, question, the psychology of what one's motivation is can get horribly complicated. Yes. But to be fair to Kant, I mean, he does have, he does say very explicitly that it, it's a good thing. There's a place for um, as well, emotions and relationships which are conducive to people doing dutiful acts. That's, that's good insofar as it makes it easy to do do the right thing and that's as it were good for society but if you're actually really trying to localize and identify the particular motivation that um, is the 
origin of moral worth, then it's easiest to locate that in a situation where the agent had a sense of conflict, of, as it were, knowing that her duty is to do one thing but wanting to do something else instead because that's where it shines forth more brightly. We might just have time just to touch on utilitarianism, Roger Crisp. Can you give us a brisk, I'm afraid, summary of what the view of the utilitarian movement was to their pragmatic approach to virtue? Yes, I mean, essentially, the, the, I think there are two main elements to utilitarianism. The first element is that um, individuals' lives can go well or badly, and that's all that matters. In other words, individual well-being is all that matters. The other element is that in the face of that fact, what we ought to do is try to produce as much of that well-being overall. Uh, the classical utilitarians believed that human well-being consisted in pleasure. So what we have to do is produce the most uh, pleasure, uh, subtracting the amount of pain, of course, from the, the total when we're doing the calculations. So happiness calculus. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, as I said, the, the virtue of benevolence really l lies behind the the utilitarian tradition, though to some extent it's now faded away and util the utilitarian principle is just seen as a principle, as it were, on its own. And what what really has happened is that um, the utilitarians have, have, have reinvented the Epicurean uh, notion of virtue, which emerged in uh, the Hellenistic uh, uh, period, um, you know, from uh, about 300 BC to 100 AD, the idea that virtue is really just instrumental to some other good. Whereas in, in, in Socrates, in Plato and in Aristotle, the essential idea is virtue is a good in itself. It's a constituent of happiness. Uh, on one reading of Aristotle, it's the only constituent of happiness, and that was taken up by the, the Stoics. So it's a sort of instrument, instrumentalization process. Yeah, that, I mean, I think Mill made that completely explicit in his book, Utilitarianism. He said, uh, that utilitarianism mains no, maintains not only that virtue is to be desired, but that it, that it is to be desired for itself. Uh, the mind is not in a right state unless it loves virtue um, as a thing desirable in itself. But he saw that, as, as Roger said, as purely um, pragmatic. You know, this is a good thing to have installed in people so that they will generate lots of well-being for others. But the, one of the interesting things about the utilitarian, utilitarian point of view is that he tots up pleasures and tots up pain and does the subtraction and, and tries to work out what the consequences are and, and, and it's all it's to do with consequences, what are the consequences of your actions. But it actually takes for, it, 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 it seems to take for granted that all pleasures were equal and then as I understand it John Stuart Mill came in and started to talk about the higher pleasures that, uh, mm. that the reading and uh, mm. listening to music and uh, that stuff was a higher pleasure, yeah. which a lot of people subscribe to, and uh, you can see why, and I do a lot of the time. But it does actually, it raises a very difficult question. Who says that's a higher pleasure? Pleasure, and on what grounds is that a higher pleasure? And that's a question I think still rages around. It not, it not only affects pleasures, it affects tastes, views of culture, views of society. I think the idea inside can there be high? Is there a, is there a hierarchy of pleasures? Mm. Is, may, may, is, it, is it central to this or an offshoot from this? What do you think? Marilyn? Well, I, th I mean, Mill was in a very tight corner there because one, <laughs> one understands entirely his motivation for wanting to make this distinction. And in particular, uh, his utilitarianism had been accused of being a, a morality for pigs, as it were, as if uh, this, the hedonism that seems to be involved in just insisting that there's this common moral currency, which is pleasure and pain, might seem to invite a life where we all just kind of sit around around, as it were, generating that sort of pleasure for everybody. Um, but nonetheless, he, he had this commitment to there being one single moral currency. And um, whereas um, in the ancients with Aristotle had the idea that there was a plurality of different values, uh, utilitarianism, because it requires there to be this calculus, requires there to be a single currency in which you can do the calculus. And so pleasure and pain seem to be quite a good uh, option. But Mill, in the end, I mean, found as in contradiction, it seems to me. Though, I mean, he can sort of technically make out that the higher pleasures are just, in the end, more pleasurable in the long term. And that's uh, one way out, but I'm not sure it sounds like a really a very plausible so one or to mean, really capture the distinction he was after. Very difficult to prove, isn't it? Right. I mean, you could call, don't you think? I mean, go. I want, what's that quotation about Socrates? Can you reproduce it? It's better to be... So uh, Socrates is satisfied than uh, a fool satisfied. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, um, or here's an extreme example of, of what the When Wittgenstein was on his deathbed, deathbed and he had a miserable and tormented life, he said, I tell them I had a wonderful life, 
And I think that that was a true remark, but it showed that that would be an example yeah. of a higher pleasure because he, you know, he was suicidal and depressed most of his life. But it was true that he had a wonderful life, striving after knowledge. And yeah. I mean, what I think the thing in Mill is that he's really torn between his his utilitarian roots, um, which um, which really come come from his father James Mill and, and, and Bentham, according to which the only thing that makes anything good is its being pleasant. And then his, uh, the result of his nervous breakdown and his, his, his realisation that there are elements in life, in the romantic life and in the life of sentiment, which can't be captured in terms of pleasantness. So he talks, for example, of the nobility of the higher pleasures. Well, nobility is quite a different property from, from pleasantness. There's something very refreshing, I suppose, in the idea that, well, basically all that matters is sort of uh, general human happiness. And yes, we better cash that out in terms of pleasure in the absence of pain. It's wonderfully non-moralistic, as it were, in sort of post-Victorian times. One can see that that would be very refreshing. Um, but in the end, uh, it does seem to me that the idea of there being a single cor common currency uh, of, of value is, is a bit of a problem. Yeah, Mr. Rosson, finally, all three of you, if we just got a minute or two, the, the, the theory of virtue seems to, has it, has it just s sailed back into fashion or has it come back, it must have come back for a reason? What's your view? Uh, well, it's, <clears throat> no, there have been people promulgating it all the way through, but there is meant, it's meant to have started the, the, from a um, famous article by Elizabeth Anscombe in 1958 when she said that modern moral philosophy was incoherent and uh, I think recommended a return to, yeah. to the virtues and it's, it's, and it's just risen, it's been on the rise ever since. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my take on that is that Anscombe's ar arguments are actually rather dubious. But what she'd noticed was that the virtues really, since the, since the 17th and 18th century, had kind of faded into the background and that moral philosophy had concentrated on notions of natural law and rational norms. And the idea of character and what kind of person one is had just really faded into the background. And other people agreed with her and have been trying to revive those very notions. Well, I think it's a good thing that that's happened. I think that morality is right feeling. That's the, essence, that's the heart and basis of morality is right emotion, right feeling, not sort of trying to keep rules, set, sets of rules. Mm. So I think mm. it's a return to the truth. <laughs> Character first. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you, Miranda Fricker. Thank you, Roger Crisp and Galen Strawson. And uh, thank you for listening. Next week, we'll be talking about John Milton and Oliver Cromwell. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.